Some people argue that although Medicare for all is a great idea, we need to move slowly to get there. But I needed Medicare for all yesterday. Millions of people need it today. The time to pass this law is now. Winning this reform will not be easy. The moneyed interests will do everything in their power to stop us. And yet despite these obstacles and despite the personal challenges that I face, I sit before you today a hopeful man, a hopeful husband, and a hopeful father. I am hopeful because right now, there is a mass movement of people from all over this country, rising up. Nurses, doctors, patients, caregivers, family members, we are all insisting that there is a better way to structure our society, a better way to care for one another, a better way to use our precious time together. And so my closing message is not for the members of this committee. It is for the American people. Join us in this struggle. Be a hero for your family, your communities, your country. Come give your passion and your energy and your precious time to this movement. It is a battle worth waging, and a battle worth winning. For my son Carl, for your children, and for our children's children. We have a once in a generation opportunity to win what we really deserve. No more half measures. No more health care for some. We can win Medicare for all. This is our Congress. This is our democracy. And this is our future for the making. Yes, it is Friday, May 3rd, 2019. Welcome to Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. On this week's show, Barr's testimony shows that we are one step closer to full blown authoritarianism. House Dems troll Barr's no show with chicken. And the Sunrise Movement gets profiled in Rolling Stone as young activists gear up to ensure that climate action is front and center in the Democratic primary debates and in the 2020 election. This week also saw the first ever hearing on Medicare for All. You heard Addie Parkin right there um, in the intro. That, that hearing took place in the House thanks to Pramila Jayapal. This was on her legislation, the one that is even better than Bernie Sanders' legislation. Pramila Jayapal gets it done. Stacey Abrams passes on Georgia's Senate run, and incumbent Senate Democrats are abandoning the Senate for 2020 in order to join the shiny 2020 presidential race, squirrel, and sell books. Cecile Richards, Alicia Garza, and Ijen Poof joined forces to launch a new pack called Supermajority. Supermajority will partner with different groups to educate and train 2 million women in activism and political participation across the country. It's going to be freaking amazing. They're going to be focusing on things like the wage gap, child care costs, maternal mortality rates, family leave, family separation at the border, and so much more. Old school labor makes a strong white showing for Biden in Pittsburgh this week. As Mike Elk, writing in the Payday Report, put it, the day of Joe Biden's presidential announcement begins with a 78-year-old former pro wrestler nicknamed Jumpin' Johnny DeFazio, clad in a designer suit, struggling with the help of a cane to get up the steps of the Union Rally in downtown Pittsburgh. DeFazio, longtime director of Steelworks Union, Steelworkers Union in Pennsylvania and council president of the county government Allegheny, is flanked by nearly a dozen white middle-aged union leaders dressed in suits. Quote, nothing says labor to me like a $700 suit. Jokes Sue Scanlon, a bus driver and proud member of ATU Local. 85. Meanwhile, about 10,000 teachers in Carolina, let's go to the other end of that labor spectrum, they walked out on May Day, storming the state capitol in a right-to-work state, storming the state capitol in Columbia to demand increase in pay, respect, more mental health counselors for students, and protection against retaliation when making comments on public policy. Michael Bennett is running for president. Googling who is Michael Bennett now. Eric Levitz of New York Mag nails it in his piece, Why I, a bland white guy you've never heard of, am running for president. 
Knock Down the House is now out on Netflix. The film, directed by Rachel Lears, follows 2018 primary campaigns of four progressive Democrats taking on entrenched big-money politicians. That includes Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Amy Viela, Cori Bush, and Paula Jean Swearingen. I can't wait. That is on my agenda to watch this weekend. And Navy sailors aboard the USS Tr- Harry Truman in Norfolk encouraged to greet Vice President Mike Pence by, quote, clapping like we're at a strip club, soldiers. Sailors, my bad. Yeah, that didn't go over so well. Today's PA focus, Harrisburg may have actually hit peak stupid this week. I'm a little skeptical that it that it can't get peak more peak stupid, but we'll see. But it was definitely in contention. On Tuesday, Daryl Metcalf invited nearly 150 anti-vaxxers and their disease-carrying non-vaccinated children to the PA Capitol and gave their conspiracy theories a platform by hosting a press conference and introducing legislation to protect anti-vaxxers. Spit on the floor, please. And if that wasn't enough, on Wednesday, the Senate Republican Policy Committee tried to one-up Metcalf by hosting another sham climate change hearing that had Koch brother-funded geographers, meteorologists, and geologists. Those are all in quotes, by the way. (laughs) One big takeaway from the hearing is that Scott, uh, Senator Scott Martin added, quote, novice hurricane tracker to his resume. Another major takeaway, however, from the hearing was, quote, we need to have the courage to do nothing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Gotta love that. Summer Lee, along with House and Senate Dems, held a police accountability rally in the wake of the Antoine Rose verdict. Speakers included local community leaders and Antoine's mother, Michelle Kenny. You're looking forward to next week. March on Harrisburg will be arriving in Monday, fighting for gift bans and against corruption in our government. Legalized corruption in the PA legislature. Gotta love it. Blatant corruption. Gotta love it. Fight, of course. And what's up with ABSCUF negotiations? Contract expires June 30th and the semester is ending. Uh, I think what I've heard is this. In today's last call, Galactic Capitalist tests the waters, joining Vice Commander of Air Force Space Command, Lieutenant General Thompson, to make the case that Space Force is going to be awesome for business. That case was made this past week at, and I swear to God, this is a real thing, made this past week the Future of War Conference in D.C. China plans on building a moon base in the South Polar region in the next 10 years. Once again, confirming that if you want to know anything about the direction of space exploration, you need to read Kim Stanley Robinson. His latest Red Moon, which I've talked about on this show, features China's dominance of the moon centered in the South Polar region. Virgin Galactic clears another hurdle on its way to the first round of space tourism. Spaceship Two completed its fifth successful test flight, and the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tickets are going fast. It's, it makes your head spin. Free Will's got another double can release this Saturday. Kangaroo Mob, a no, no boil, I, uh, no boil IPA, and that's a collab with Birds Fly South Ale or, or South Ale Project in Greensville, South Carolina. Also, uh, a ride down the five, uh, just in time, once again, Cinco de Mayo, Mexican-style lager, and it's part of their uh, Brewers series. Um, This is done by uh, one of their brewers and former San Diego resident, Derek. And I did pick up last week's release, Satisfying Chaos and Imperial Chocolate chocolate Stout, and whoo, chocolate ganache indeed. And shout out to friend of the show, Mike, who furnished me with two of his latest homebrew stouts, Rogue Bear Chocolate Stout and Old Rumpole Chocolate Stout. And I'm breaking them open this weekend, probably as I uh, sit down and watch Tear Down the House. <laughs> That's it. So thank you to Mike. And Sean has a recap from Forest and Main's 7th anniversary party. And he's got an awesome photo shoot coming this week. Want to remind everybody, tune in, to, tune in to The Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org or tune in the Dish Network, DirecTV, through the Free Speech app on Groku. Also, check out Rick's daily podcast. Um, you can get that wherever you get your podcast. The Rick Smith Show, to search for that, iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you will. And if we want a progressive future, we need a progressive media. Yes, and you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as 5 bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. 
Not ready to become a member? No problem. Just go to RagingChickenPress.org. Click on the big blue donate button on the right sidebar. But the best way to invest in keeping the media in the movement and the movement in the media, become a member as little as five bucks a month. That's like a beer a month, folks, by going to patreon.com slash rcpress today. Sean, Sean, welcome to the post May Day week. Yeah. <laughs> happy May to We're, you. Yeah, ha- happy May Day. Happy Workers Day. Um, how'd you celebrate May Day? Uh, working. <laughs> <laughs> working only eight hours, though. I'll have to say that. That's you know, good. Yeah, I, I, I refuse. I was like, well, at the very least, right, if I'm not going to kind of like uh, uh, being out kind of uh, tearing things down or kind of like uh, organizing, then uh, mm-hmm. I'm just definitely limiting um, my work to under eight hours uh, for that day, despite it's the end of the semester for me, right? So this is actually the busiest time of the year. Um, but it's uh, – so that was it. Yep. It was that. And, it, you know, it was like it was also uh, – uh, my son has basketball on sa- on Saturdays, so I was kind of like you know working all day. Come home, go out and spend some time with my son. Has basketball, went out for dinner afterwards. You know, t- you know, th- did some good stuff. So that was fun. How about you? Um, I celebrate by working a little bit. Working a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is the emphasis on a little bit there, or is the emphasis uh, on working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to. Uh, I was in the Capitol at eight o'clock on uh, Wednesday morning for the uh, climate change hearing. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> I know that I was in the Capitol like at eight o'clock twice in like a calendar month. It's pretty, uh, yeah. Mark this one down, everybody. This is May 3rd, 2019. Sean Kitchen is at work at 8 a.m. twice in one week. <laughs> <laughs> one month. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Didn't mean to overstate your case. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, no, but, uh, it was. <clears throat> it was a good day. It was a bunch of press conferences, uh, stuff going on the Capitol. It's actually like the busy season uh, in the Capitol when like every session day going on has like 15 events, uh, all the all committee hearings and press conferences. So uh, we're at that time of the year um, where there's like a thousand or two thousand like visitors roaming through the Capitol. And, you know, it's really great to doing that is to cause a public health crisis during that time. That's always a good idea, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. To 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 try to cause a public health stir. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, there you go. Well, we're going to get into all that because it was it really was. I mean, I have to say this was uh, definitely one of the kind of uh, weeks in competition for kind of you know peak craziness. There's no doubt. Like one of the, yeah, like um yeah. So we we could we could talk about those joys in the second segment. Oh, so, we're um, going to we're going to believe me. So, uh, <laughs> so great. So this week, of course, uh, the news cycle was dominated by uh, William Barr, Attorney General William Barr's testimony um, before uh, the Senate, and then his choice to kind of blow off the House uh, hearing that he said he was going to attend on Thursday. Um, you know, I'm sure that if you've been uh, half, even half paying attention, that uh, you know the kind of major points of what's happened in the bar testimony this week. So I'm not going to kind of review all that stuff. Um, but uh, I, I do think that there, the the legacy of I mean, I, I was explaining this to I was explaining this to somebody this week, Sean, and I was saying I, I was saying it like this. It's like, you know, Sean and I have talked on the podcast before about how you see things going on. Right. And then you start saying, OK, the, the trajectory of this is into like into this full blown authoritarianism. And you can see it happening. You can see how quickly that could happen. And then you start to think like, holy shit, am I becoming am I am I going am I am I going crazy? Am I blowing things out of proportion? Right. And you get this like reality check say, oh, no, that's that's crazy talk. And then you're like, actually, it's not. It's not crazy talk. Like It's, it's crazy to think that it's not that it that it's not possible. And that's kind of what I felt watching this stuff this week was just kind of like, here you've got the attorney general, one, just blatantly lying right, uh, to Congress, two, um, just refusing to answer stuff, and three, basically saying, no, I'm not going to allow these people to testify. Meanwhile, Trump is basically saying we're not going to release any documents. And so you're at the point where... I think what's going to happen is that you're going to have uh, the House, like committees are going to issue, start to issue subpoenas, right? People are not going to respond to the subpoenas. And then the question is, then what? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is like the making of a constitutional crisis. Yeah. I mean, it's like, so let's say if you violate, if you and me, right, were to violate a subpoena, somebody comes and arrests us, right? They come and get us. 
So let's play that out. And like, so who goes to force the person to testify? Like, I want to know what body does that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Trump's I mean, Justice Department. Well, the, the Attorney General. Exactly. Right. Do the FBI. And is the FBI is like Trump going to call on the military to protect the White House from the FBI? I mean, I, I mean, again, that's that's I, 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 I don't want to go there, but. So if he loses 2020, is this like a dry run to like what could potentially happen? Exactly. Like if he if he loses in 2020, I exactly. mean, like is he going to? I mean, he's not going to leave fucking peacefully at this no. point. I mean, he's going down kicking and screaming. No, that's I, absolutely right. And I think, like you know, I mean, I, it's, it, it's how how hard is the crash going to be? I was having this conversation this week and um, a couple days ago, and said um, somebody was saying he's like, you know, God, if he was smarter. Right. Uh, if Trump was smarter, then he would be able to kind of have this authoritarian. So I said, no, I, said, I don't think so. I said, I think like most authoritarians are not like like brilliant. Right. What they do is they constantly test the waters and realize they get away with stuff. Right. And they look all what they crave. Number one is power. Right. And if you have if you are not governed, you don't have an internal governor inside you that tells you, like, there's a thing called shame. There's a thing that kind of like 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 a lack of morality. There's a thing that without ethics. If all you care about is power, and that's the only model in which you you just continue to try to fill the space, and this is this is who the Republicans have been, right? Since Ronald Reagan went, was in office, yep. Like I mean, like these aren't like fresh faces that tr- Trump is like stacking his administration with. He is stacking his administration with some of the most horrible fucking human beings around from the past like thirty years who have been actually known in national politics. I mean, yep. Barr was the person who sandbagged. Iran Contra. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, Barr has done this in the past as being the fixer. That's right. Like, and like, I, and I, I, I was like, like, go ahead. Sorry. No. And like, this is, this is the, this is the path the Republicans have been going down for the past 30, 40 years now. I mean, this is not nothing new. No, it's been, it's been the long march. No. And now we're getting pretty close to the end of that march. It seems it's like, Indeed. I mean, I, I look at it like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I just I, I I mean you couple I, this with like the attacks on workers' rights. I mean like this is the type of stuff that actually happens in fucking authoritarian countries. Well, exactly, like, and I'll tell you, I mean, and I, like I, the erosion of worker rights, the uh, the 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 outlawing of unions, um, like the you know like the and the power of right wing authoritarian government. Like this is like not this is not nothing new. No, and I, I think, look, and I'm on board with, like, people like Masha Gessen and uh, Sam Cedar was talking a little about this this week. And the, there was, uh, it, it was the idea that, look, I don't think our actual, our media culture has really, has really got its head around this stuff. And, and, it's, and it's really problematic because I continue to, like, you know, listen to these podcasts and watch the news and stuff. And you've got these, like, Democrats or kind of, like, critics, right? Not necessarily kind of Democratic Party folks, but critics of what's happening and they keep on saying things like, well, I mean, uh, William Barr should understand. You think that he would know better to, to, than to do this. And it's like, when are these people going to get it through their heads that it's not no, about it's their not lack of knowledge? Their well, this, yeah, this is not about their ignorance of these things. They just this don't is, care. Yeah, full-blown lack of morality. Right. This has nothing to do with them being unaware of the problem. And this has been a long-term problem for progressives and Democrats, right? They think that, like, oh, the facts will just set us free. It's like if they actually knew, if they had gone to that class, they would understand and they wouldn't do these things. And it's like, no, no, no. They're operating from a whole different worldview, which is totally about power. That's and you it. have to start playing by the rules that they are setting. You have to. I mean, otherwise, because I mean, it's, like, it's like, no, okay. So they they reinvented the game. Mm-hmm. They retooled the game for their benefits. You have to start playing at, on their level. Like it's like you know when they go low, punch down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they don't punch them in the face. Like it's like that type of stuff. It, it's kick them like water yeah. down if they go low. Like it's. I mean, this is the type of stuff that they're doing, and it's like, like because there's 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 such and, a lack of like the 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 distance between what you hear about this this crisis rhetoric that you get from. I mean, okay, from, here we go. From, from, wait, 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 wait. Let me finish my thought. Let me finish my thought. So you get the crisis rhetoric that you get from like Democrats and progressives who say, on the one hand, this is a crisis for America. American like is on the is on the uh, is on the kind of like you know the 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 verge of kind of going down authoritarian, right? And then the response 
in terms of practical response to that knowledge is kind of like, well, I wish that if they just knew, we have to tell them what they should do. Like, no, those two things are out of whack, right? The Enlightenment project that you're talking about is no longer in effect when it comes to kind of like running a country into the yes, ground. The other side just does not give a shit. Right. It, 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 they, are, they are totally just checked out of the right. game of caring. I mean, you see it this week uh, with the anti-vaxxers. You see it with, you know, the climate change hearing. Like, you, these are people who just don't fucking care anymore. Right. You say, hey, here's a fact. And you're like, so? <laughs> uh, oh, good for you. You got facts? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to be debating if the earth is fucking round at this point. Well, we already are in some corners. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it may start happening within the PA House or Senate. Like, it, it, like it's... It, Why I mean, not? But like... I mean, but like this is the point, like where the Republican Party has gotten to within yeah. this this state and within this country. Like, I mean, you have you have a subset of people who just don't care. Like, um, man, I guess we, like, well, okay. So look at Doug. Everyone on Facebook, or look into Doug Mastriano, who is running for this thirty third Senate district, uh, replacing Senator Alloway. The dude is a straight up white nationalist. Um, you know all the memes that he is sharing, like, and like Frank. Our Val DiGiorgio from the Republican Party pretty much said, yeah, this is this, this guy represents the values of South Central Pennsylvania. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he's talking, calling like uh, stuff like blaming shit on Ilan Omar, going after trans rights, um, going after, uh, you know, sharing uh, Jack Posobiec, a, a screenshot of Jack Posobiec, the alt-right troll, um, resharing about like Trump uh, killing babies after they're born, like in hospitals and stuff oh, like this. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, he's like share, I mean, this dude's a straight up white fucking nationalist. This is this is what the, this is what the Republican Party has become. They do not care about like about participating in the game of democracy. Yep. Nope. They don't. Nope. For them, it's like a you know, it's like it's not the game of democracy. The game is power, right? Yeah. And that's it, right? And if it's like if they if they have to use the language of democracy, you know, to get, to put a cloak on what they're doing, then they'll do that. They don't care. Right? Yeah. They're not wedded to language that approximates the truth. And that, that doesn't now, now let's be clear. Now, we're not saying that, well, therefore, we need to make shit up, too, as well. That's not the point. But the point is that, yes, you have to have you got to know your facts. You got to know your, your background. You've got to be grounded in reality. But that being grounded in that way and having knowledge of things is not the same thing as political action. Political action is something different. Right. And the only thing, as we've said a thousand and one times, the only thing that gets the goods in this kind of context is collective action. It's not putting hope in kind of some kind of like, you know, sparkly candidate. It's not kind of like, you know, hoping for the best and giving our thoughts and prayers. It's organizing, period. Right. So whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's crazy. I do have to say that I saw this. Right I did not see this before. And you were kind of like, yeah, I was like, saw you looking at your Twitter feed beforehand. But I have to say the fact that. uh uh, the House Dems trolled a bar pretty good at, for him not showing up uh, to the hearing yesterday. Yeah, um, Steve Cohen, who I think is the last white Southern Democrat <laughs> in the legislature, right? I, I, he may be. I, I think he's one of the last like white Southern Democrats to actually exist, um, just because of how racial politics are and mm -hmm. the way the South is just right. you know horribly and obscenely gerrymandered. Um, the um he showed up with a bucket of kfc <laughs> and a plastic chicken <laughs> and um he was eating fried chicken at nine o'clock in the morning and then as after he well he got up and he put the chicken on the on on the table where, where, where had, bar's had name put, was put, put put reps or put put the honorable uh, bar on there. <laughs> Great. Yes. And uh, he was calling him Chicken Bar. Chicken like, Bar. I got to go to the Chicken Bar. <laughs> and then, um, yes, and then there's photos of him eating fried chicken um, on at 9 o'clock in the morning in a suit in the house, which, I mean, hey, this is, again, as we just said, this is, this, this is how you have to, to handle these people. Treat them like fucking ch children. Yep. And humiliate them like this. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's no other way to do it. I mean, you like, you know, it's like he's not really listening to reason. It's not that he doesn't know things. You're not going to get accomplish anything other than that, other than they're just stonewall. So, yeah. So we'll see. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, we've been saying this for a while, too, as well. It's like, look, you got the Mueller reports coming out. Mueller's going to testify at some point. 
but really like that is not even if you get the full story about that, that is not going to solve problems right that we're going to get to know things about what happened but that is not is what is going to get the goods so some, that magically people are going to know and things are going to happen no the organizing is where it's happening so um one of the things i thought just two things that we don't need to talk about extensively but um just wanted to put on things rolling stone did a a, a phenomenal uh profile of the sunrise movement this week and it was uh, they profiled them and they interviewed some of the activists, right? And it, it was I want to say phenomenal. I shouldn't say phenomenal profile, right? Because it wasn't as as like in depth as I, I I would have loved to have seen. Um, but the fact that it's in Rolling Stone and they're kind of privileging the sunrise uh, the sunrise movement is so important as young activists are gearing up um, for the twenty twenty election. And you know, frankly, is that these are the folks that have got it right. Um, that is going to require direct confrontation and action in order to ensure um, that we have some sort of liberal future, right? Or at least kind of like, you know, um, non-dystopic future. Um, and so this kind of activism, um, they are really gearing up. They're doing all sorts of training and organizing. So um, I'm really, really psyched to see what they're going to be doing. And we're going to be following their actions as we kind of, as we move forward. I'm uh, sort of bummed they didn't touch upon the Scott Wagner issue in this. Uh, you're bummed about that? Yeah, come on, self promotion. Shameless self promotion. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, like, uh, in I thought all you meant this one. Like, the Earth moves um, closer to the sun every year. We have more people. You know, humans have warm bodies. So yeah. is heat coming off? We're just going through a lot of change. But I think we are, as a society, doing the best we can. Uh, an oldie, oldie but goodie. Oldie but bit. Oldie good but goodie. Oldie but goodie. Yes. Uh, Scott I Wagner. How, how we miss you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, for the comic value was really good. That was definitely true. No, I mean, like, uh, what I was going to get to is that, like, you know, the, the Sunrise Movement, um, you know, when they were first starting out in Pennsylvania and actually in, like, the Lancaster area, uh, you know, I was actually able to talk to one of the organizers uh, and just give them some tips on how to follow stuff and keep a track of um, what's going on in Harrisburg. Um no, I mean, like, I didn't realize that they were going to, like, blow up like this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and it shows you how a social media savvy generation uh, can really control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's coupled with the fact that they were active before the 2018 elections. They were, they actually, were gearing up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were actually endorsing some candidates. Right. And, and the, obviously AOC was one of the major ones. And once they decided to endorse, they actually worked to get them elected, right? So, and they they were they were endorsing people and organizing and talking to candidates at that time about the Green New Deal, right? So that kind of like when AOC got elected, right? That was kind of that's the synergy that you want. That's the inside outside that you want, right? And yeah. um, this is um, and so you know we're going to be definitely looking to them as we gear up to twenty twenty. Yeah, and they, this organization has single handedly changed the conversation mm -hmm. around climate change Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So, cool. The other thing, major historic event uh, in the House, first ever hearing on Medicare for All took place in the House this week. Uh, the was on uh, Pramila Jayapal's uh, Medicare for All proposal, because, of course, in the Senate, you've got Bernie Sanders. Um, He's got a proposal, but of course, in the Senate, it's dominated by Republicans. It's not going to get a hearing, but in the House, um, that hearing took place. And man, front and center, um, as you heard in the intro today, the testimony of uh, Addie Barkin, uh, who basically has LAS, uh, ALS. He's been um, a health activist or a medic, uh, uh, medical activist for a long time um, before he got ALS. And uh, when he came down to it, he's been rapidly deteriorating right, to the point where he had to give his testimony through this uh, computer generated voice, which he speaks to in his in his um, in his um, opening statements. Um, but I think the, the, the there's other you're going to hear other segments of his of his opening statements on other news programs. But I really wanted to play that section in our intro, in part because I think he's got it right. There are some people that urge that we just go slow, that it's too far. It's a nice idea. This is true for the Green New Deal. This is true for Medicare for all. It's true for like, you know, um, stopping the kind of, you know, uh, 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 the separation of children at the border. It's for, you know, you name it, like f f um, raise of minimum wage of $15 an hour in a union. I mean, any of the major issues that are kind of on the table right now, protecting women's rights, you know, we need to go slow. We can't, we don't want to upset people. No. And he's like, no, no, that's not it. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity here and we're either going to grab the ring or not. So, um, 
kudos to him, man. It just, uh, it, it, uh, I've been learning more about him. I have, you know, had read his, some of the stuff before, knew of his activism, but, um, it's, it's quite a courageous story. And, um, kudos to Pramila Jayapal and I have to give a shout out to Chris Hayes too as well because uh, in the midst of all the bar hearings this week uh, Pramila Jayapal was on there to talk about her participation in that committee Um, but he made sure he carved out time right to actually go and ask her about the Medicare for All hearing and she was visibly kind of excited about him doing that and he played um, a big section of Addie Barkin's uh, uh, testimony uh, which you know Unfortunately, because of the uh, bars hearings this week, uh, the uh, Medicare for All hearing got got sidelined. But yeah. other things this week is that you got a whole bunch of shakeups, big questions about what's happened in the Senate for 2020. Uh, there have been high hopes that Stacey Abrams uh, was going to be uh, would take on the run, and I, you know, Schumer put on a lot of uh, like. I don't know what you call it, pressure. I, don't, I can't imagine Schumer being able to pressure anybody to do anything. But uh, he basically was definitely trying to encourage her to run, and she decided not to. Uh, what's your take on that, Sean? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like she is a 2020 VP candidate. Um, I don't think she's going to be Biden's VP candidate. <laughs> but um, I feel like she can match really well with, say, an Elizabeth Warren, a Bernie Sanders um, type. I mean, you know, like she – to me is in that progressive lane of that um of like the, that area mm-hmm. do you think that was part of the consideration i don't know i know i i i knew i didn't realize she didn't consider her run i mean like i know that people want her to run in 2020 but i mean or she wants to continue working in changing like georgia's voter system yeah that's you know a, I mean, that's like, what i wonder thing, mm-hmm. like the thing that she like you know set off to do mm-hmm and so uh, we'll see. I, I mean, I just like I trust Stacey Abrams to make the right decision. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's like everyone's got a lot of hopes about about you know what she could do and stuff like that. But you know, I mean, she's been doing amazing work. So, however, she's deciding to do that. I mean, she's she's got kind of better understanding of uh, where she can be effective than uh, any of the kind of pontificators do. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was really excited this week about hearing about the launch of this uh, new pack called Supermajority. Um, Cecile Richards, as you know, she was the uh, the former head of uh, Planned Parenthood. And um, she basically brought Planned Parenthood. Like, she was a labor organizer before then, right? She brought those skills to Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood, which had been a, a fairly effective but kind of, like, loosely networked um, – I don't know loosely networked is not exactly the right word – but more of a kind of a networked, dispersed uh, um, series of advocacy organizations across the, across the country with a loose kind of national affiliation. She basically turned that into a national powerhouse organization um, that now Planned Parenthood is now over 11 million members, right, um, which is unbelievable um, as a national organization. And they've been so incredibly effective under her leadership. She stepped down last year, I guess, last year. Um, um, and... She's been kind of saying, I'm still going to be active in things. So she's teamed up now with Alicia Garza, who's, of course, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and Ai Jen Poo, um, who is the um, uh, head of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, right? All three of them, the three of them put together, those are three of the best organizers in the country right now. And they are joining together, and they're basically saying, we're going to train kind of like, what do they say, two million women in activism and political participation across the country. And they said, look, we're going to ensure that women's agenda is represented at the ballot box, right? And to drive changes around major issues like the wage gap, child care costs, um, maternal mor- mortality rates, family leave, family separation at the border, and so on. The real argument is say, look, women do the, the vast majority of the work when it comes to political campaigns, yeah, except the issues that are kind of directly affect women's lives, right? Not just abortion, right? Because that's how a lot of times that people want to just like take abortion and say that is the only women's issue out there. But to kind of redefine the entire agenda and get people elected uh, elected in 2020, but more importantly, to build a big mass base and organizing base um, to kind of uh, take on that task. So this is something to watch. I'll tell you right now. Um, the, again, three of the best organizers in the country are ahead of um, a supermajority pack. Uh, I can't wait to see what they're going to do. So eyes on them. Um, and uh, I guess the other the good news is that um, – um, Uncle Joe was uh, back in Pittsburgh this week, Sean. <laughs> yeah. How about um, that? 
Yeah, no, I've been, I've been dying to like talk about this. Okay, uh, please, because I, I love this, Mike Elk. I, I love the re- the thing that like Mike Elk put up there. Um, I mean, like it. I will say this: Joe Biden does not represent like the part of the labor movement that like I am an activist in. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's I think it's just that plain and simple. Like, you know, he does not, he, he, he unequivocally does not represent anything that, I mean, yeah, we may share this, like, I believe it. We may have some of this, like, similar beliefs, but, like, uh, from an ideological standpoint, Joe Biden does not represent, like, the labor movement in this country. I mean, he's a centrist Democrat. He's a fiscal conservative Democrat. Um, He... You know, he courted the banks, the credit card companies. Um, yeah. So what? Who cares if he supports infrastructure? No, that's right. Like, well, like other Democrats. Will. Like, right. so who ca- like it's like, you know, he has taken actions that would keep uh, that, that, has, you know, mostly affected them. Like, who are the emerging members of the unions of the labor movement and which part of the labor movement we're talking about here? You know, like at. As the labor movement as a whole, uh, you know, he is not really that his record's not friendly towards women, women of color, right? Single mothers, um, or like you know, immigrants, people who are making up the new labor movement, right? Today's modern labor movement. No, and he, that- he, what's that? No, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just saying he, he like you know, and like it, it's, um. <clears throat> It'll be it'll be interesting to see how this pans out because I feel like um, this sort of report um, put is sort of like having some labor leaders putting people on notice to support Biden in the state. Well, look, and I think that's what it, what's important for people to understand is like because again, because- there's also I mean, it's also like this wing of the the you know looking how like you know more the progressive unions in the state. Um, you know, there's definitely a divide between. Uh, different parts of the labor movement when it comes to supporting Democrats and different races and stuff like that. Right, exactly. And this is, this is the, the important thing to remember is that exactly as Sean said, is that this is a particular grouping in the labor movement. And what Biden is attempting to do is use this particular grouping and then basically say that he stands for labor, that he's the labor guy. Right. So I, I want to read just a little bit of this uh, Mike Elk piece to give you a sense of the flavor. I think he does a really good job in kind of characterizing this particular branch. And I also say this, um, the people in this argue, article uh, mm-hmm. that Elk is talking about have been doing good work. It should be noticed that, you know, like these people are good at what they do. You know, like before, like I say, before we like get into this conversation, uh, you know, like and yeah, there were they, these are the people who are responsible for. Um, getting Connor Lamb and getting Pam Ivino elected and flipping critical uh, House seats or Senate seats in Western PA. Mm-hmm. Like this is where the labor movement has been like retooling and stuff like that. But so. Um, no, exactly. Right. So what he says, what basically what Elk points to in here is that, you know, you're seeing you basically say, look, most of most of most of labor is remaining neutral when it comes to the uh, the primaries. Right. Um, they're basically staying out of it. And they're saying, look, this is the primary process is going to is going to um, is going to play itself out. But a small kind of like vocal minority of union leaders, pr- primarily those in white male led construction, firefighting and fossil fuel heavy industries. Um, they're the ones who are going to kind of going to moving in around Biden and want to endorse early. Right. So let me just read a little bit of this. So instead of focusing on building support for among women, communities of color and millennial socialists, labor's old guard gathered in Pittsburgh on Monday to declare that a moderate like Biden is the best candidate for bringing white working class voters back into the Democratic Party in places like Western Pennsylvania. Quote, Biden is someone who, whether whether you are far left or the center, he runs on issues, the economy, infrastructure that connects you with um, connects you, whether you are an SEIU member or a carpenter, says Pittsburgh era La- Labor Council President Darren Kelly, wearing a diamond studded uh, lapel pin. This is kind of what the kind of thing that Elk always does. Now, diamond studded lapel pin of his union, the International Association of Firefighters, which endorsed Biden on Monday. Kelly went on length, uh, went on at length to express his frustration with presidential candidates who are supporting the Green New Deal. 
quote, when you have a situation where you're taking away from someone's ability to feed their family, that is not going to be looked on favorably, says Kelly. Quote, when you put something together that is going to cost 100,000 energy jobs, I'm going to be against it. I'm going to be vocal against it, and I'm not and it not welcome it in western Pennsylvania. Kelly, a native of the rough and tumble working class and predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhoods of the Greenfield of Greenfield, rejects the idea that Biden's advocacy for mass incarceration policies could dampen enthusiasm needed in communities of color or that Biden's treatment of Anita Hill could dampen turnout among women. I just don't see it, says Kelly. Right. So after they go out and kind of um, after this kind of thing, they march down, they go walk over to kind of the Teamsters local um, um, 249, a union which has faced heavy criticism from union democracy advocates, in part because that union stripped its members of its pensions. Right. Um, That's a problem. Right. Um, And so this is. This this is I know how they how they like how he brings up the omnibus bill. Right. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, we didn't like it at the time, but we're still supporting Biden. Like, dude, like part of his job as vice president was to advocate for the on the bus, was to advocate for the grand bargain, you know, like was to advocate for these things like cuts in Medicare, cuts in social social insurance programs. Like, I mean, like. I don't know if people were like around in the 2008, the 2000, you know, when Obama was in office, but progressives spent a lot of fucking time, too much time, uh, actually, defending these programs. Yeah. When they should have been like when we, when we shouldn't have to have been on the defense on our own side in this. Right. And let's, uh, and let's also remember that like, Biden, I mean, like Biden was like, a was a super strong supporter of NAFTA. Right. I advocated for NAFTA. Right. And this is exactly the kind of the area of the country that was impacted like greatest by NAFTA. Right. So you've, you've got these again. This is why I wanted to highlight this is like I, I don't think your, your point before is well taken is that you see a lot of these folks in these in these movies have done the fantastic organizing work and things like that. That's that's I great. Mean, I mean, and like Mike Kelly and also like the women who ran for office out or Darren Kelly and the women who ran for office out there. Um. You know, we're and like, you know, a lot and the SEIU state council, like the state three, the three statewides, like they all contributed to flipping those seats out in Western Pennsylvania, like and picking up those important seats. But I mean, like it, it, it. I don't know. I mean, no, look, I mean, like, absolutely. The thing, but the thing is, is I, that I, my, I just, my bigger just, point here is that, that what's this happening here is that this represents a particular, like, a particular orientation in the labor movement, right? Which is about let's go moderate. And like he even says, basically, a little bit, a little bit later on, like, says that inside the union hall, 17 year old firefighters union president Harold Schaitberger is one of the first to warn union members not to ask for too much in 2020. Right. So this is the other side of the kind of like, you know, anyone but Trump kind of movement. Right. That whole idea that we can't go big. Right. Um, and, you know, again, the fact that this, the, the Green New Deal is mischaracterized here as somehow throwing all these people out the cold. Like the Republican policies are the ones who have been throwing these people out like out in the cold. The Green New Deal accounts for a transformation. Right. That is not just about like like an Obama or Biden area job training garbage where you basically and- say, hey, go take a couple classes and hope for the best. This way you actually can buy out people's contracts to ensure that they're going to be taken care of and to locate like the new industries and the new energy industries in these areas. I mean, and this is also like our Jeremy Jeremy Corbyn like moment in this country. That's right. Like to actually like course correction, have a actual like course correction for the Democratic Party writ large. Just mm-hmm. like completely sh- like this. This is, I mean, like this is happening right now. I mean, like there is a course correction going on within the ideology of the Democratic Party, and you know, Summer Lee said at best, you know, he just does not represent us. Like that's it. Yep. <clears throat> Yep. I mean, he represents the old dying guard. Right. And, like, again, and he's not representing, he does not. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the other side of this is that, you know, again, you know, the, the other activists in the labor movement who have worked systemically and like who are basically of charting a new course for labor that we've seen for the teachers union strikes that we've seen in the, the organizing that SEIU has been doing on the ground in communities of colors for decades. Like this, like here you go, this right here. Nothing says labor to me like a seven hundred dollar suit. Yeah. Bus driver and proud member of the ATU local eighty five. Mm-hmm. For Joe Biden though, this is his base. This the the type of union leaders that show up to rallies in suits. Yep. I mean, like, I don't know about you, but like, I have not had a suit no, since, I, no. in, like, in like eight or nine years. Like, 
<laughs> no, but I mean, I just I, I don't have to wear a suit to work. Like that is like the labor movement, though. No, it is. Like, yeah, I remember. I'll, I'll never forget. Like, for example, you remember when when Corbett when Corbett was proposing all those budget cuts, and I've talked about this before. But when Corbett was proposing all the budget cuts, there were um, and kind of a tax on labor. This is in the wake of the Tea Party victories in twenty and twenty ten. There were these mobilizations of labor. Right. Um, in the state capital. And you had Teamsters come in. You had mine workers come in. You had SEIU. You had, you know, like the teachers you had. I mean, I mean, everybody was there. There's these mass um, labor turnouts. Right. And I remember that one day I was there for this. Right. And this was after, of course, you will remember back in 2011 is that labor, along with students and other and community based activists and things like this, had taken over the state capitals in Indiana and in Wisconsin and Ohio. Right. There have been these mass rallies and kind of occupations. And these workers that I was standing with at this rally, right, these kind of union members who were there, um, there was a good chunk of them that were from the steel workers. There were a good chunk of them from, uh, um, from uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, AFCW, right? Um, there were a good chunk of them that were also from my union, ABSCUF, right? And we were at the doors, right? And the, the talk among the activists, the talk among the people at the doors to kind of go in there was like, we're going to take this over. We're going to take this over. And you had a representative from the state AFL-CIO kind of get up there and um, kind of give this big speech and kind of rally everybody up. Everyone gets cheering. And everyone gets happy. And the cameras are all on him. Right. And he's up there in his suit. Right. And his nice kind of nice cropped hair and everything like this. Gets a nice seat. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And then the cameras go off. He finishes his speech. Everyone's a cheer. And they start to go in. And then he turns after the cameras are off, turns to everyone else. No, 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 no. We're not going in. We're not going to do this. Right. And basically told them, no, we're not going to go in and occupy this space. And what was said, I'm not going to repeat half the stuff, what was said by these workers, right? The steel workers, were the, in particular, the ones that I was near were so freaking mad that to sit there, you got to be kidding me. So this was all a PR show for you that you think you're going to do this through your PR and through the media. We have to be in there and occupying. But the, the, at the top level leadership, no, no, no. We just wanted a show of force, and we, but we still have to now. Now we go back, kind of behind the scenes, and kind of in the back rooms. And I'm, I'm telling you, that is not was what's going to get the goods um, in this next generation um, for labor. So, I know. I think. I mean, you've seen it over the past seven years with the fight for 15 militant actions. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, like work. Yeah. I mean, the teacher strikes. <clears throat> no, yeah. la- la- it's you know, um, 2019. Labor is labor is popular. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> how about that? But labor is only popular when it's active. Because of, yes, because of the because of the activism that's going on. Exactly, labor is not popular because look, frankly, is that you try to talk to people about about contracts, right? As as you know about a contract and that kind of stuff. You try to talk make it as a public, um, as a public show of what a union is. People just go to sleep. Right. If it's somebody's, if you're talking about in the shop, right, at a, in a workspace, you're talking about contract. That's meaningful because it's directly atta- attached to people's kind of like work. But when you're trying to talk about what the, what is a labor movement, right? What are we doing? What the demands are? That's not where the energy is. The energy is the fact that no, we collectively can do things. That this is our country, right? So, yeah. There it is. And, you know, meanwhile, just at the same week, right, the same week that this is going on, that you had 10,000 teachers in South Carolina, a right to work state, basically took days off, right, used personal days and, and kind of marched on the Capitol um, and kind of demanding for, you know, a kind of like, you know, more pay and but respect and health care counselors for students. And they want a protection against retaliations. There was also walkouts and mass gatherings in kind of several states, North Carolina yeah. as well, around the country. Now, what um. When do you think a candidate will actually outright propose outlawing right to work in like a national right to work program? That's, you know, I'm trying to think. I don't know if, if Sanders has said that. Yeah. I, I mean, like. Or if and, I, and if, if Warren has said that, too, as well. I'm just I, I seem to remember that, but I'm not I, I'm not I'm not clear. Yeah. I mean, the, Yeah. So it's a good question. We'll do that for next week. That's our homework for next week. We're going to go through the candidates. And we're going to look at who's actually taken on right to work stuff. That's a good idea. Yeah, I like it. Um, Michael Bennett. Don't know. Don't care. <laughs> um, but I do have to buy a sticker because I've been I've been collecting all the stickers because this is the, the craziest like Democratic primary season I've ever seen. So I've gotten uh, I've gotten several of them so far. I've even got um, my favorite one so far. Has I know got, you've, you've been showing me. I know I've been keep on sending them. my favorite one, though, is this one, I think. Best one ever, like Marianne. 
join the evolution. <laughs> Are you uh, going to get an Allen House sticker? I, I got to get them all. I got to get them all. No, no Republicans though. No Republicans. Okay. No I mean, Republicans. Alan Howell's running for president. You should uh, get his sticker. I, I gotta. I, I'll get it. There's some that I've actually tried to get them, but they don't have. They don't have a store yet, or at all, because it's not about running for president. It's about selling stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> they finally re- learn how to grift from the Republicans. <laughs> so, uh, I, just and just once again, one another reminder. Um, key thing uh, this uh, week on May Day: um, knock down the house. This documentary that um, uh, looks at. Uh, four candidates that basically they were endorsed by uh, justice Democrats and brand new Congress. Um, and this documentary follows their campaigns. Um, and one of them is AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Another one is uh, Amy Viela, who I believe was that her, her, her kid was killed right in gun violence, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, Corey Bush and, and Paula Jean Swearingen. Um, Paula Jean Swearingen, was, that was freaking amazing seeing her stuff. Um, in West Virginia, um, take on um, take it on the machine there, but um, so this is a documentary about it. I've heard nothing but awesome things about it. I'm, I've got it on the agenda to watch this weekend. If you get a chance, uh, check out Knock Down the House on Netflix, um, uh, streaming this weekend. Um, yeah, pretty much. Anything else for the good of the order, Sean? Uh, no, it's good. I'm great. Ready, ready to move on into the next segment. Ready to move on to the next segment. Sean's been giving me the come on, come on, wrap it up, shut your mouth, Mahoney, for a while. So, all right. So, uh, yes, everybody, I want to remind you that the best way that you can support the work of this podcast, of Raging Chicken Press, uh, like as I've said before, we have got an intern. It's now official. We've got an intern that is coming on for the summer. Uh, we've got another new writer out of the Lehigh Valley that is going to be coming on this summer. Uh, his first piece may be showing up soon. Uh, we're going to get start him right off on a uh, good little argument for socialism so it's um uh, it'll be kind of a good deal um so uh we got as we bring on new writers we're going to need your support to kind of uh, help keep this going especially if we want to be prepared to fight in 2020 so the best thing you can go do is to go to patreon.com slash rc press become a member of raging chicken for as little as five bucks a month and uh if you join at the ten dollar a month level right um once again i want to remind folks that uh, i will send you a copy of david wallace wells's book uh, the uninhabitable Earth, uh, life after warming, um, it's critical, and um, I'll even throw in uh, a Sunrise Movement sticker for you because I've got a bunch of them here um, um, that I bought off their website. So uh, there you go, ten bucks a month, you get David Wallace Wells' book, Uninhabitable Earth, plus a Sunrise Movement sticker, um, and you can support uh, progressive pull no punches homegrown media. So this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll be right back with PA Focus. <laughs> Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1886. A little after three o'clock on that Monday in Chicago, radical labor activist and newspaper man August Spees climbed onto a boxcar to give a speech about the fight for the eight hour day. For weeks, he had been giving speeches all over the city in the ramp up for the large May Day strike and rallies. Despite being exhausted, he agreed to address the crowd of German and Bohemian lumber shovers. Very near the rally where Spee spoke stood the McCormick Reaper Works. The McCormick workers had been at the heart of labor struggles in the city. 1,500 workers had been locked out of the McCormick plant over a dispute about wages. Tensions ran high as the company brought in scab labor to replace the locked out workers. Approximately 200 striking McCormick workers picketed outside the plant. As Spees gave his speech to the lumber shovers, the shift bell at McCormick sounded, marking the end of the workday. As the scabs exited the building, the angry, locked-out workers swarmed around them. Suddenly, shots rang out from the direction of the McCormick plant. Spees climbed off his boxcar and ran to the plant to see what happened. There, he found 200 police officers shooting at the strikers and beating them with clubs. In all, the police killed four strikers and wounded many more. Outraged, August Spees ran back to his newspaper office, where he drafted a circular that urged working men to retaliate for the police violence. He began to plan for a rally for the next day at Haymarket Square. In what would become one of the most significant events in the global labor movement and history. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Welcome 
Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out the Coop podcast. And it was, yes, indeed, stupid week in Harrisburg. <laughs> Sean, take it away. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Where are you beginning your busy, busy week? Um, yeah. So on Tuesday, uh, Daryl Metcalf invited a shitload of anti-vaxxers and their unvaccinated children uh, to the Pennsylvania Capitol with like a thousand, two thousand people inside the building at that one time. Hachu! <laughs> <laughs> like, and like it, it just so happened, like the first reported cases of measles mm -hmm. uh, was out in Pittsburgh that very same day. So like you have all these anti-vaxxers coming into the fucking um, place. And um. So as this is unfolding, it's their version I'm of the it's their version of herd immunity, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so like as this is going down, I am sitting in a policy committee, just tracking it and seeing what's going on, and I am watching Stephen Caruso tweet from this uh, press conference, mm -hmm. and this like might be like one of the most like he had like one of the most insane like political threads like ever on Twitter, <laughs> like of just like live tweeting something. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were people at this press conference comparing themselves to civil rights activists and that like, you know, like the, the anti-vaxxers are being persecuted just as much as AIDS victims were back in the early eighties. Like this is the shit that was being said, like at this fucking event. That's what I hear. I hear that's true. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. They and and um, <laughs> and I did see guy, some of his tweets. Like that thread was epic. I have to say, I mean, it really was. I mean, it was like, I mean, I mean, it was just, it was endless. Like I mean, you get, you get the sense that, like, as he's tweeting this stuff, like his head is just kind of like going, <laughs> you know, I mean, like. <laughs> I mean, just like everyone's like, I mean, you're just like watching all their fucking reactions to this. And like everyone is like, and everyone else like involved in like Pennsylvania politics Twitter is also like retweeting Stephen's like thread and just like, this can't be real. <laughs> like, like we have hit like peak Daryl Metcalf. And I mean, like, no, like what he did is dangerous. I mean, like, phys like, physically like actually, dangerous. like really, not like metaphorically. <laughs> And metaphorically, I mean, what he did was dangerous. He brought unvaccinated people into the Capitol, and you don't know who, who has like autoimmune disorders who can't be vaccinated, or who, and if there's like people who are going through chemotherapy and stuff like that. Like, I mean, there are always doctors and patients and other advocates walking around. You don't know if they're sick and right. like they're not vaccinated for medical reasons, for right. legitimate medical reasons. And like, I mean, like, you're putting their lives at risk by bringing these people into the fucking building. Right. And you're also putting the well-being of anyone else, like, at risk, too, who may, might not have a booster shot that's, like, strong enough in their system. Right. And, you know, like, yeah. And you get measles because some little fucking, like, disease carrier is roaming the capital. Like, I'm actually surprised they didn't bring, like, like some kid with measles. Like, looks like, see? It didn't kill him. <laughs> Right, you know, I mean, seriously. Then you find out everyone in that whole thing breaks out with measles. The next don't day. tread on my mumps, bro. Right, don't tread on my mumps. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> give me measles or give me death. <laughs> oh my god, give me measles exactly, exactly. Like, but it's it is freaking scary. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like that the fact that 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 it. I know, but also what he does is why this is dangerous because he would just legitimized a movement right. and gave him a platform. Exactly. That's the point. Which is more dangerous. Right. And he did it. I, I don't know if he did it as a fuck you to, like, Republican leadership because he didn't get his um, his Judiciary Committee spot. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like, I feel, feel like that, like that's the only, like, logical reason at this point. Well, you, He's, you're starting from the premise that he operates on the basis of logics, right? I mean, come on. No, I think he I, – I actually do think he's smart. Like – I don't know. We were talking about he pushes that, like, how far he can go. Yeah, that's true. That is true. I mean, he's smart enough to do special, that. It's a special kind of smart, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, no, he is, like, a, he is fucking pathological, like, fascist. And he'll, you know, he is that, of that mindset of, like, just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And, like, he didn't get a spot on the Judiciary Committee, so now he's just even pushing and pushing even more. So... 
There was that. Oh, man. Daryl, Daryl Metcalf. There it um, is. I, I did get a video of, like, everyone leaving the press conference, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was which was awesome. Just, like, you have the, face, the looks on people's faces, you mean, like that? or And they're all happy. Like, they're like, oh, man, look, someone's giving this attention. I'm like, no, I'm not putting you up there because this, <laughs> this is, like, for your – I'm not putting you up there because you people are smart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting this up there to warn your communities. <laughs> yes. I'm putting this up there when I'm going to have a flashing letters underneath the video that's saying pariah, pariah, pariah. <laughs> have like like arrows pointing at their heads. Like. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Not vaccinated. <laughs> Danger to others. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Oh so. my God. So that so uh, so that was it, right? So that was that was the end of crazy this week. <laughs> no, there was more. <laughs> um. Oh boy, on Tuesday, um, the House Republic or no Senate Republicans. This is the upper chamber. A Wednesday, the, you mean, right? Oh yes, on Wednesday. So this is this is the upper chamber. The adults. <laughs> the adults in the it, room. In the room. <laughs> 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 um, they thought it was, they they behooved themselves and invited Dr. Uh, Gregory White or yeah R- Wrightstone back. Uh, he was the person who testified at last month's uh, House climate denial hearing. So I, as soon as I walked in the room, I didn't know who was like speaking. Mm-hmm. And I walked in. I looked up. I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> it was like Groundhog's Day. And I just walked out of the room <laughs> laughing. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just like, I can't handle this right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's Groundhog's Day. Here we go again. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like, I knew it was going to be bad. And here, like, they brought other like the Heartland people there, um, Doctor Legatus, and they brought a uh, meteorologist there. But they brought like meteorologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, who was more interested in talking about wrestling, and he made an Ann Coulter uh, metaphor. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's, it's astounding. It really is. Yes. So, um, so uh, actually, the, um, the uh, Philly Enquirer uh, actually covered uh, this yesterday because um, the, U- the U.S. House uh, actually voted with logic and reason. A couple days ago uh, on climate change, and then like the PA House, uh, the PA Senate then steps in and gives us. Uh, so um, starts off um, Majority Policy Committee Chairman Senator David Argo of Schuylkill County said the goal was to have a civil conversation uh, where we can all sit down, discuss the real facts on the issue, and have a meaningful conversation as to where Pennsylvania stands in controlling its emissions compared to the other states, while also discussing the larger picture of how the United States compares. In controlling its emissions compared to the other to other countries, these were three so climate deniers. It just, it just just kills me. It just really rips. You know, again, if if it wasn't like if if we weren't talking about life and death issues here, it would just be purely like a, like like comical circus, right? But there, I, it really does. I mean, it, on the one hand, I laugh so much when I hear this stuff, and at the same time, it gives me a pit in my stomach. Yes, because so, I mean, when when we're sitting there, like and. To the the very the very fact like I mean you sent me some of, or some of the videos um like you showed me kind of you know, pointed me to some of the videos of this stuff and I'm just like looking at that and the the Argyle yeah, is from reality well it's reality. just like Argyle's like actually asking questions as if this is not a completely settled issue and as if that that guy with his self like his self published book is somehow like some oracle. For the truth, I mean, it's a, it's really so, unbelievable. All right, so there, there's this writer in in in, in the newsroom, uh, Chris Komisak. Mm-hmm. He writes for Capital Wire, which is a he's extremely conservative, and he was saying like he started having this conversation that the science is not solid. And I said, "Excuse me," and I said, "Like you, you're like you are a modern flat earther, like if you do not believe in this." And he looked at me. He he got pissed, and he said, "Some well, the science." I said, three percent." And then he's like, no. I was like, I was like, yes, three percent. And then he's like, I said three percent. And other people, like other writers, are looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I was like, no, three percent. That's the amount of people in your scientific community who actually are the skeptics, the deniers. 
Right. Versus 97% of actual scientists in peer-reviewed papers. Right. And 3% in science is like is it, the it, best it, you it, get. Insignificant. Well, that's what I mean. It's like you talk about 97% of the scientists are kind of on board with this. Any disagreement in there has to, I mean, it has to do with like rates of change and the kind of like the timelines for this stuff and about cascading events, right? I mean, a whole bunch of stuff like that, right? There are actual arguments going on as to what's happening and how severe. It, that's exactly right. But and those like, arguments I mean, are all in because, agreement that it is happening exactly, and that we are driving. Right. Is that the, the baseline science for the, like that's been set that was settled like in the seventies. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean it's like and right and now, right, here here you go. Every you know, whatever. I mean the, and the fact that these people these people can even with a straight face um, say and you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right to say you're a modern flat earther. That's that's the only way that is like appropriate um, to respond to that. Yeah, I know. Like I, and I said that to him in the newsroom, like in, in an argument. <laughs> like, Good. I know. Uh, so this is. The, I'm going to con- continue with this uh, article from uh, Philly, Philly. dot com. Uh, the committee invited Penn Environment, but the group balked. Uh, saying the agenda for the day appeared to be stacked, stacked the deck with climate change skeptics. Uh, the three scientists who ultimately testified were David Legatus. Now this should be in this, this should be in air quotes. <laughs> the scientists, <laughs> uh, David Legatus, uh, Joseph Bastardi, and Gregory White- Wrightstone. Legatus, a professor of climatology at the University of Delaware, says geography on his thing. So he's not not even like a climatologist in the sense of like physics and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> at the University of Delaware is affiliated with the Heartland Institute, a conservative public policy think tank that counts the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation and General Motors as supporters. Wrightstone, a geologist, is listed as with the Heartland Institute. Bastardi, a television meteorologist, is well-known climate change skeptic. Like, um, here we then you go down, go down. Um, but Senator Scott Martin disputed uh, the committee was trying to uh, stack the deck. He noted that David Titley of Penn State, uh, Center for Solutions and Weather Climate Risk, and John Wallister of PA Environmental Council were also invited, like Environmental PA. Uh, T- Titley and Wallister both dropped out the 11th hour uh, instead uh, to come share their beliefs, uh, no different than all the other three, Martin said in an email. So, I mean, like, no, you don't debate these people in public. You are tipping the scales by giving them equal weight. Hmm. Like, you found three climate change skeptics and, like, no, and good on, like, that we're not going to participate in this circus. And that's what it was. Yep. Yep. The meeting was a fucking circus. I mean, there's go, just no man. other way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the circus that, you know, there's like, <clears throat> and really, uh, we have to just look at the old, there's only one way to look at the, these kind of hearings at this point, right? And also, and also, this is, this is the Senate Policy Committee hearing. So yes, they are not um, listening, like they're not writing legislation, but what they are doing is they're inviting these people to speak on issues like climate change. They invited Rick Santorum last year. I mean, they hold these meetings at 830 in the morning. They kind of schedule them at the last minute. Like, so people don't like actually go to these things and legitimately criticize them. Yep. Yep. I mean, these are the people writing the policy and making the suggestions. And like, this is where like this stuff like starts to percolate its way up into like the modern fucking thought process of this sort these people. It's just crazy. I mean, the only way, the only, th- the only thing, like, I, I actually, you know, I totally agree with the fact is to, 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 to completely boycott this, um, this kind of, this kind of sham, because when you have a hearing that is, that is set up in that, in that particular way, that is not about what are we going to do? Like, we just want to let both sides speak and let the facts speak. For it's themselves. a waste of time. It is nothing but a delay tactic at this point. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally behind not showing up for that stuff. And if you're going to have a hearing, because the only thing that we need to have on the agenda right now is how do we address the problem? <laughs> right. And we have to and it has to be like a straight line. And there's like probably like three things that we can do off the bat. But every single one of them requires dramatic cuts and elimination of f- burning of fossil fuels, period. That's it. Right. Everything else after that, it becomes like like on top of it. Right. And now. 
obviously is that I'm a, a, a strong proponent of the Green New Deal. Right, um, I'm a strong proponent that I was even before there was a Green New Deal. I was on board with what Naomi Klein was saying, what, what the Leap Manifesto um, put forward as a way of kind of addressing these things, is that we have this is the moonshot. Right, I agree with AOC on this one. This is our generation's, your generation's moonshot, and it's our last shot at it. Right, yeah. <clears throat> and so that's the thing. So it's not just a matter of like, can we do this? Is that we have to do this. Right, and we can do this. The technology exists. All that is standing in the way is will. That's it. And we got. We have to shame these people in public. Absolutely. And, and I mean, like, um, the staffers who are in the room were not liking my tweets as they were coming in. Too bad. For and them. then, and then we also have to talk about the photo. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so, um. The I love CO2 buttons. I love CO2, Sean. <laughs> made their way back into the crowd. And um, in the most unironic fashion, they were being worn by, like, the people who were, like, the absolute oldest people in the room. Like, people <laughs> who are not going to be invested in the 2020s. Like, like I mean, people who are, like, actually, like breathing cadavers at that point like and three like um and so there were two very old people geriatrics pretty much and i guess like their kid their son like in his 60s maybe all wearing the i love co2 buttons and then right in front of him is the guy from the commonwealth foundation also wearing his i love co2 button and i like towards the end of the meeting i was like i couldn't pass up that shot Got to do it, man. Got to do it. Again, arrows. <laughs> pointing. <laughs> pariah, pariah, pariah. <laughs> like, this is who we're up against. Yeah, like, that's right. I mean, like, this is, this is like, I mean, it is like the most un, it is like the most ironic photo that you could, like, catch. And people were messaging me afterwards, like, wow, cannot believe you fucking posted that thing. Like, uh, like, I was like, I couldn't pass it up. How could you not? It was right in front of me, and I'm just like, "Hey, look! If you're gonna if you're gonna ha- give, put your hand out with candy in it and offer me a piece, I'm gonna take it. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Even if I'm on a diet, I'll save it for later. You know, I mean, it's like, so. Oh man, yeah. uh, that was a butte. That was a butte. Like, like this is who they brought out. Yep. Like this is this is yeah. Like this is who they brought out. Oh my god! Well, you know, I also uh, well, no, I, 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 I'm just going to stop. <laughs> I was just looking at as you're talking about so De- Leg- Legatus, right? Yeah. So I was just kind of like uh, uh, poking a little bit more around about this guy. Uh, this guy is also a signatory um, of the thing called an Oregon pre- um, petition, um, which was basically uh, something that was done by a bunch of evangelicals saying there's no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. Right? He was also He's also a member of an organization um, that is called the Cornwall Alliance. Yep. Right. The Cornwall so, Alliance. So yep. Doug Wright, Gregory Wrightstone is also part of the Cornwall Alliance. Yep. The Cornwall Alliance is an evangelical Christian organization um, that has put out a long period of time ago uh, an evangelical declaration on global warming. Um, and basically is, that we can plunder the earth's good because God put the resources and it's our duty to use them in the most bountiful way as possible, which is also a bullshit Genesis. Um, there's also a, a competing Genesis story where we are to be stewards of the earth. Yep. You know, um, yep. here's how, here's how, yep. Here, here's how they, over that. yeah, here's how they call it. Like the Cornwall Alliance uh, for the Stewardship of Creation is a conservative Christian public policy group that promotes the view that the free market approach to, to care for the environment is sufficient and is critical of much of the current environmental movement. In particular, the Cornwall Alliance rejects claims of global warming. Originally called an Interfaith Stewardship Alliance, it was founded in 2005 in reaction to efforts of evangelical leaders such as Rick Warren to fight global warming. The name Cornwall came from the 2000 Cornwall Declaration. The organization views on the environment have been strongly influenced by the wise use movement of the 80s and 90s. Right? This is the stewardship stuff that Sean was just talking about. 
right? So, I mean, you, you have that. And if you look at some of the, the policy things they put out, it's just like, again, it's like we're going to wrap in and like rampant kind of extractivism, right? The worst of free market capitalism in the cloak of evangelical Christianity. And we're going to sell it to everybody. It's so messed up. So um, <clears throat> one last thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Also, uh, I guess this just, this just came across my Twitter feeds. Um, <clears throat> Pat Eiding, leader of the Philadelphia AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. was just quoted in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer from Chris Brennan. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tweet that Brennan just threw up. This whole Joe Biden th thing kind of disturbs me a little bit. Um, this is not to disrespect Joe Biden. I think jumping out too soon will leave us in a position that's too fragile. And he er, says Philadelphia AFL-CIO leader urges unions to keep their powder dry in presidential race. <laughs> I agree with that position. You know, like, I think, look, I, I'm, I'm totally for that. I mean, that's actually pretty surprising. Yep. I mean, I, I'm I glad to hear that. <clears throat> yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I, I do think I, I agree 100% with that, with, with that's exactly how it is. Cause look, I, I look at it like this labor has been, uh, look, this is where I get in my, put on my kind of like, you know, get my, get my back up on my, my labor side is that labor has been taken for granted by the democratic party for a long period of time. Yet labor has made up a good portion of the foot soldiers that have gone and done the, the grunt work on a kind of campaigning and door to door knocking in communities and so on. Right. Um, not to say that there's not tons of other people who do that too as well, but Labor has been relied upon um, for its infrastructure and organization in order to do that stuff. I think, in, in especially like right now, I think we, I think number one, I think we can all get on the page to say that um, we have got to stop the government that's in existence right now. Um, but number two, um, we're going to have a, a it's going to be really hard fought um, campaign. Uh, for the primary, and, and I think it's going to be an important one for the future of the Democratic Party. And um, if, if labor um, w wants to kind of be part of having influence moving forward, it has to wait until the general. I mean, if it gets down to maybe one or two candidates and some people start jumping in, I, that's, that's, I know that's going to happen. But uh, it, it's insane in my mind um, to get out, um, get out this early. Yeah. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> um, and also this week in the Capitol. Summer Lee held a really big rally. Uh, it was put on with the House Dems, Senate Dems uh, on police accountability. This is uh, in the in the sane chapter of uh, what happened this week. This is in the positive sane chapter yes, as opposed this, to the this, crazy this, chapter. This, this is in the sane chapter. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she held a rally in the wake of the Antoine Rose verdict. Um, speakers included uh, Ed Ganey, um, a bunch of Philadelphia reps, Summer Lee. Um, and Antoine Rose's uh, mother spoke there. Uh, that was definitely, and you know, they brought out like 400 people from uh, Antoine's community uh, who were speaking, uh, family and friends at this rally. Um, it was, it was good. It was emotional. Um, no, and it's. <clears throat> I think it's. I think it's. This is showing that uh, you know. I think Summer Lee's going to be the real deal. Yeah, I was just about to say is like you know I mean, she could just continuously like kind of it, it just impresses me to no end. Uh, is she is emerging as definitely uh, one of the leaders, if not the leader of the kind of the the, the new folks um, uh, who were just elected in terms of its kind of public advocacy wings, right? I know there's lots of other stuff that's going on, but man, she is um, front and center, right? Um, and awesome for her, and awesome for her to take uh, to take. What happened with Anton Rose, right? And um, said, no, we are not going to be quiet on this. Right. And we're not right. going to let it just like be saturated out there in the Western media market. We're actually going to make this kind of a statewide public policy issue. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, it was a, it was a really good rally. Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, like Summer Lee is going to be the real deal when it comes to getting stuff done uh, with stuff in Harrisburg. Whoop, whoop. Definitely like. <clears throat> I know she speaks so well. Um, she knows how to speak in front of small part, small groups, fundraisers, uh, or at like large rallies, and she's always on point. Like, <clears throat> but um, yeah, yeah, awesome. And then uh, next week, next week, right off, uh, right at the beginning of the week, we've got another kind of major uh, event in the sane category. Yes, March on Harrisburg is returning to Harrisburg. They are marching right now. They are more than halfway here. And uh, Monday, they're coming back. 
They left last Saturday, right? Yes. Yeah. And we had I met up with Mike and a few others at Forest Mike Pollock, and Maine on is. Friday That's night. Mike Pollock. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and a few they, others from March on Harrisburg. Yep. Nice. They had a they had a, they had a, they had a, they had a pre happy hour uh, Friday night. Um, they had a few beers there. So that was always that, that's fun. So is that far as it made twice over the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice, very nice. So do check it out. Um, and uh, one thing, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to give uh, before we go to break. I uh, definitely wanted to give an update on uh, Abscuff uh, negotiations. Uh, people may remember we had a one-year contract extension, uh, and now uh, contract expires on June thirtieth, and. Uh, um, the latest updates uh, from kind of like, you know, ladies just off the wire are. So uh, this has uh, some of us in the uh, kind of uh, on the activist orientation uh, within Abscuff um, being a little bit concerned, a little bit concerned that business unionism is once again sneaking back into um, uh, the work of Abscuff um, after years of, of turning the organization towards a more uh, militant organization that was able to pull off the kind of strike we saw in 2016. Um, and the concern is, I'm not saying this is exactly where things are, but part of the concern is that um, that uh, that kind of mobilization that we had an opportunity to kind of make use of to kind of build an organizing union um, that um, kind of coming off of, the, that, of that 2016 strike um, is being um, kind of sidelined and in favor of um, the way things used to be done. So, uh, but we shall see. Um, I'm willing to be proven wrong. And, um, but uh, I'll be looking forward to kind of uh, seeing what goes on. All I know is that it's the end of the semester and uh, you're not going to get anybody mobilized uh, when the contract expires um, between now and then. So, or it'll be very minimal. So I, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's my uh, my my fun little poke in the eye as we kind of come to the end of this uh, little segment. Uh, but I want to remind everybody: if you like, what's a couple of the things that Sean has pointed out there about the uh, uh, about the uh, rally that Summer Lee um, kind of put on about Antoine Rose after the at, uh, wake of the Antoine Rose verdict. Um, the fact that you've got March on Harrisburg be arriving on Monday. Um, this is exactly the reason that um, we are um, kind of reaching out, looking for more kind of writers and media activists that are willing to get involved with Raging Chicken Press. Um, be awesome. Like, if you think about you want to be on the ground there as these rallies are happening, to be able to reporting back at Raging Chicken Press, um, to be writing articles for Raging Chicken Press, what's happening over in the Lehigh, Lehigh Valley, um, down in Pittsburgh, um, or out in Pittsburgh, down in Philadelphia, um, and in your community, what's happening on the front lines of fracking industry, right? Um, don't wait. Um, for other people to hopefully th to take up that look for writers in your community that we're willing to get involved and we will work with you to help develop you as a media activist and to ensure that um, we keep the spotlight on the movement right that's what raging chicken press was founded to do and uh, basically we need to bring more people in if we're going to be able to kind of get this reporting um, keep this reporting going but anyways this is kevin mahoney editor and founder of raging chicken press we will be back right after this with today's last call this is Kev Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull no punches, progressive reporting, and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Space. 
space is a war fighting domain just like the land the air and sea ah uh, yes my favorite space force right what started out as a side comment and a joke has turned into another branch of the military how about that and like yes life and times in the uh in the trump era um, but I just wanted to, um, in terms of this week's space news, uh, oh, yes, we should say this week, this is today's last call. And the last call, once again, is about space news, about beer and just other fun stuff that we got hanging around for the week. Um, and the Galactic Capitalists are testing the waters this week, as I mentioned in the intro today. Uh, there was the Future of War conference being held in D.C. It's actually sponsored by Arizona State University, uh, but it's put on in D.C., and uh, one of the things that you saw out there is that you had some of these kind of galactic capitalists, right? The um, emergent private sector, global and, ca- and galactic corporate interests um, teaming up uh, with a very receptive vice commander of the Air Force, uh, the Air Force Space Command, Lieutenant General Thompson, um, basically to make the case that Space Force, like, it, you know, it's almost like one of these things, kind of like, but don't laugh at the Space Force because the Space Force is actually going to be awesome for business, particularly these emerging industries. If you know anything about the way that um, government and the military and corporations kind of kind of influence one another, when the military, like military is like the largest section of our budget, right, of the U.S. budget, when the military makes a decision to pursue a particular course of action, it has a disproportionate impact on those industries that are affiliated with those um, with those areas, right? So, for example, there's been a while ago, and not a lot of people know this, but the military was actually on the leading edge of, of solar power in many ways um, because they were realizing look if you're out in the field you're especially out you're in Iraq you're in Afghanistan you're kind of deployed in places that are you know um, in some areas pretty remote that you need to make sure that you're going to have um, consistent power All right so one of the things that the military began doing is that um, to kind of really investing in solar powers and so and kind of localized solar grids to ensure that they um, that all their commitment would be up and running right and so obviously if you have an organization that size that is going to outfit its um um its you know its outpost and its um uh, uh, um and it's you know, all different branches with solar power that is going to kind of boost the industry right um and especially if you decide to say hey there's this american company we're going to keep it bought, like stuff bought in america that's going to influence that so the same kind of argument is being made here but now it's a little bit more plain like uh, in plain sight they're saying look You've got all these companies here that are invested in kind of like, you know, ex- what seems to be experimental stuff at this point. There's big, there, we're starting to see um, landers um, for the first time ever landing on asteroids in order, and coming back with uh, samples to test the mineral, mineral content of those asteroids for potential mining down in the future. Um, we're seeing that um, the, the, the push towards privatization of kind of um, near Earth orbit, like where the space station want to hand it over to private industry. Um, competition now happening in the space thing. China is going to have its own uh, space station um, in the not too distant future, um, which is um, they do not coordinate efforts um, with uh, the United States um, and the the, um, uh, the the International Space Station um, because of some, I could talk to you about that at some point, but there's a law basically um, policy that says that you don't cooperate with the Chinese on this stuff. Um, so the Chinese are is doing it independently. Um, so there you go. Um, and then you have a, like a conference in front and center. There you go. You got the uh, vice commander of the Air Force Space Command saying, hey, let's do this Space Command thing because it's going to be awesome for these big corporations over here. So um, I'm telling you, this is, mark my words, like I'm going to archive this in some Smithsonian thing someplace where I'll say, yes, I was talking about this stuff when. Right? Um, Sean's going to be an old person on a rocker sitting on a porch like, I can't believe that this stuff came I to I feel pass. like this is like predating. This is just like... This, to me, like, this is just, like, pre... This is, like, the precursor to the collapse of our society. Like, like... Yes. I, I, <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, no, like, all this shit about, like, this is just a precursor to the collapse of our society. Like, I mean, we are, like, talking about building a fucking moon base instead of, like, the actual issues at hand, which, you know, there is no Earth 2.0. And I feel like we're just like, I mean, this talk of like the space shit is just marching us down that path to like, we'll just find another planet to like inhabit when that's just not how things work. Right, right. But I think I, I, would, have, I would have to say this, right? I don't believe my personal kind of stance on this is that I don't think these things have to be mutually exclusive. 
right? No, but I, I feel like the I feel like the the backing argument, like the the thinking, the rationale behind this is that this the, this is our absolutely. You're absolutely right. Saving grace to climate change. So look, one of the things that you feel okay, maybe just do is like a, a detour in, into kind of capitalism here for a second, because one of the things that is that you you see right, especially within the history of the U.S., but this has been the history of capitalism, is capitalism is about expansion. Ever, right. ever expansion. Like exactly. E- expanding into infinity. Right. If you if, if you think about if you just think about, for example, you take the one term that is at the central of, of, of capital logic, right? Growth. Right. That we have to grow. We have to grow our economy. Right. I think all the indications, if you're going to talk about um, if you're going to talk about um, uh, like building a sustainable planet, the, the very idea of growth has to stop. Right. We need a whole different organizing principle and in a way to think about what it is that we do and how we do it. And there's this great book called Donut Economics, right, um, which offers this other kind of model. And it's getting a lot of kind of like traction in international circles and things like this, obviously not within the U.S. Right. But this uh, Donut Economics is, is, is kind of where it's at. But anyways, so you have to kind of contest growth. And the absence of that is like when you hit your limits of growth. You have one of two things. You can have a collapse, right? Or you have to go yet to the next extreme. We see this with fracking, right? Once, you're, once you've exhausted the easy to get fossil fuels, you have to go to more extreme measures in order to continue the same logic. And like, usually what happens is when you continue that logic, right? It actually, you actually have to further consolidate like a, a kind of a more ruthless form of capitalist development. Like this is, this is like, Using a straw to suck out what's left at the bottom of the keg at this point. Like, that's I right. Mean, I mean, this is pretty much where we're at. No, that's absolutely right. And I think that, look, because look, like, if, if, let's talk, let's say, if you talk about the moon base, right? If you talk about a moon base, the, the idea about a moon base on its own terms, just by itself, outside of this uh, the specific context and logic, Right. There's nothing to say that that has to be in, say, opposition to. Right. um, Addressing climate change head on. Right. They don't have to. It does not have to be an either or. However, this is why I keep on talking about galactic capitalists is because that is the way in which this is being thought through. The fact the Obama administration was actually pretty instrumental in, in eroding away um, some of the protections that we had um, for the non-commercial development of space, right? When o- the Obama administration decided to cut the space shuttle program, right, and not have something put in its place, but then to turn that over to private industry, right, um, as a way to solving the problems, that is precisely the point that was dis- basically like, re- like release the hounds kind of thing. Right. You're going to go after and we're going full scale extractivism, except now we're we're going beyond the boundaries um, of Earth's atmosphere. And that's where we're headed. And when when I see that's why I pay attention to this kind of stuff, like in like in particular. Right. I mean, yes, I think space stuff is cool and I'm fascinated with it and all that kind of stuff. But the particular developments that I'm talking about here on this podcast. Right. Is very much about um, the, the specifics of how this is playing itself out, because it's not playing itself out in ways that are going to be very helpful to any of us. Right. It's actually just going to further consolidate the power of kind of some billionaires. Right. Um, And what Kim Stanley Robinson will call in the Mars trilogy. Right. Um, Metanationals. Right. We're going to go beyond um, kind of the the kind of consolidation of corporate power that we have now. And it'll be something different. So like you wait, what happens when you have um, the, the first corporation that finds an asteroid that has kind of like is like rich with very rare earth metals? Right, um, they're going to be making trillions of dollars off of that extraction, like right? platinum and stuff like that. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. Because you think about every single one of our smartphones, every single one of our computers, every single one of our of our devices is dependent upon resources, mined resources, right? And it, until we have kind of like biological ways of which kind of conducting electricity and, and um, developing computers, computer systems, we are going to be reliant upon many of those um, those components. And that is going to just force these people, right, especially the Silicon Valley based um, billionaires that are kind of promoting all this stuff that is going to just kind of look look for more places to extract in order to kind of deepen their power and control. So there we have it. Um, 
in my happy thing. And what, what's wild is that um, if, like I said here, China is actually planning on building a moon base on South Polar region. And so I just mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson, his Mars trilogy, but his latest release, which I've talked about on the show, is Red Moon. Um, that the whole premise is that the moon has already been colonized at the beginning of that book, right? And um, China is actually the dominant player on the moon, right? The United States is really kind of like, like in the backwater. Right. In terms of the moon. Right. Even like the way that um, Kim Stanley Robinson writes their um, like their presence and their technology and their ways of thinking about it. It, it feels like something that like you're totally backwards um, and where China has a richly developed um, um, series of bases. Right. And presence on the moon. It's in the South Polar region. And there's reasons for that. And what's wild about his stuff is that he always does this. He's always pointing us in the directions to be able to see this. Sean's getting very upset with me, but that's OK. <laughs> Um, the other thing would say uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, Galactic um, once again has a, another successful uh, round of testing for its Spaceship 2. And that is because Virgin Galactic is going a little bit of a different model than some of these other companies, is that they are all about space tourism. And uh, they're looking to uh, take up their first group of space tourists in the not too distant future. They don't have an exact date yet, but um, this basically will clear the way for it. And tickets are selling for $250,000 a piece. So uh, uh, there you go. You know who's going to be up there on that first flight. But what it does tell you is for the first time, we are, what we're going to start to see in our lifetimes, right, um, is that people taking their cell phones, like, up to space and taking pictures out the window right of the earth below and that's going to make it to instagram and facebook and twitter you watch um it's gonna be crazy and like the fire festival yeah, yeah the social go. media influencers will just fucking eat it up you know what's gonna happen you know what's gonna happen you can see it right this is what's gonna happen so anyways in beer news this week uh free will has got another double can release tomorrow um it's saturday um one is kangaroo mob that is a no boil ipa brewed in collaboration with birds fly south ale project that's uh based in greensville uh, greenville south carolina that features rye malt lemon drop hops gunpowder green tea and local lemongrass from barefoot botanicals um it's described on their site as a fragrant refreshingly flavorful with herbal notes of zesty lemon hints of ginger sun warm grass mint leaves and a nutty doughy earthiness that reminds us of lemon poppy seed muffins and tea in the morning and that comes in at 5.3 ABV. And then Ride Down 5. I think I actually talked about this one last week. Um, but it's coming out. It's a Mexican-style lager in time for Cinco de Mayo. It's an uh, amber lager with a soft, beady character, touch of malt, sweetness, balance hop profile. That also comes in at uh, four or 5.4% uh, ABV. Um, that one's actually the second of their release in their brewery, brewer series. Um and that's from Derek, as I talked about the, uh, at the beginning. Last thing, I just want to give a shout out to last week. I talked about the uh, the release, uh, one of the releases, uh, Satisfying Chaos, which was an imperial chocolate stout that came in at like a hefty uh, 14.1 ABV. Well, I did go get some of that. Um, and it is fantastic. Um, it's described as kind of having a chocolate ganache. Right. And I tell you, I can't tell you how dead on that description was, um, but it does it does pack a punch. So just beware. But it's really nice. Um, they still have some available. You can pick those up in four pack cans there. Um, lastly, for on the beer news, for me, at least uh, shout out to Mike. Uh, Mike, thanks again, man. I uh, got you a couple bottles of beer, uh, the Rogue Bear and the Rum Pole, uh, both chocolate stouts. Uh, they are on my agenda for the weekend. Uh, Sean, man, what you got? Um, as far as the main seventh anniversary party. Yeah. Did, did you have the appropriate dress? Did you were you able to get to the clothing stores in time to get, get you all Philly <laughs> geared up? I was just wearing my jeans and a hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get a haircut, you... special haircut for it? No. <laughs> just jeans but, and a hoodie? Uh, was it a special hoodie? Was a Cirque Survive hoodie? Yes, it was. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, uh, I got a good thing I'll share with you afterwards. Yeah. Okay. That. Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No. Uh, it was. It, but it was nice. It was. It was nice and cool. Uh, it's. It was only uh, rain drizzled a little bit, but um, no, it was a nice big like uh, block party, pretty much. So, got to have some beer. Uh, had a bunch of free beer. Nice. Free beer is good. Yeah, free beer is always good. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was a good show. Uh, and they, they, they had a bunch of music playing all day too. And yeah, that's to test out the lens. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, so that, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you because you, you shared you shared with me a couple of the pictures that you took. So you did bring your camera with you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Did it, did it spill any beer on it or anything? No, I did not. Thank goodness. Yeah, so I kept it. I kept it dry. <laughs> <laughs> kept your powder dry. <laughs> that, but that that is my uh, that that thing is just an amazing uh, piece of glass. Uh, it, it is gang. So. I, if you shoot with like a kit lens that you get, you can tell like the images are pretty soft. Like mm-hmm. when you spend twelve hundred dollars on a on a on a, on a lens, <laughs> like <laughs> I think Sean, Sean just like like gulped as he said that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> screech! I can hear people like crashing the car. But no, when 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 you use a professional camera lens, right? The quality is just is is really good. Uh, on the glass, and uh, no, I have a really cool photo shoot coming up this week, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, uh, something you can talk about or no? Uh, I uh, <laughs> it's, uh, we'll keep it down. We'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. We'll, we'll talk call about it the, next, we'll talk talk about about next week. week. We'll talk about next week. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, no, it's a really cool photo shoot. Uh, it's definitely. Uh, I actually had to write up my first contract for this, like, <laughs> and um, no, I mean it's. It's, uh, Sean it's, did a whole uh, lot of legal research, right? Uh, had had to consult some lawyers. Uh, <laughs> we had to put together a whole contract system and stuff. Thought Google, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Google <photography> Esquire contract. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Google uh, photo contracts, <laughs> downloadable free. <laughs> no event photography. Event fo- oh whoa. a little bit more dirt. Dirt. Direct. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Event photography. But no, you uh, you got to do that just to uh, yeah, protect yeah, yeah. your images. Um, and it's something definitely I have to start considering now that I am doing shoots for people on multiple occasions and actually starting to build up some relationships with uh, different people out here. So, um, no, it's something that I have to start doing it just out of, like, being responsible. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Well, you're, I mean, you're, look, your stuff is really good, too. I mean, your stuff is, yeah. uh, I mean, you got just some freaking awesome images. I mean, you, know, you talked about last week about how you're going to have to, you know, your pick from Summer Lee's going out in these times of summer. And uh, uh, I, th- I just suspect we're going to begin to see more and more of your stuff. So, I know, like, uh, I, I mean, I said it when I bought the camera. Uh, 2016, going to some of those rallies really is what inspired me to get a camera. I really, like, always had a knack for, like, being able to eye up a shot with my cell phone, like getting video work and all in the Capitol, yeah, like, yeah. you know, getting some of the, like, it's always something that just seemed natural. And no, it, it's, it's fun being able to have this lens, like uh, a couple of the summer leaf photos I took from the, the one rally. I mean, like to like, cause the way, like the feeling was at the, at, at this, um, everyone sort of like stormed the podium, which is not how these rallies go. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people had their cell phones out recording. So I was standing in the crowd with this lens and what's so good about this you can create such a shallow depth of field with it where like she's in focus everything behind her is out of focus but also you can like use that like person taking the cell phone recording that Mm -hmm. and yeah it just framed up the shot really well and like this lens allows for like really a lot of creativity cool man Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of next week. It's gonna be great. Uh, you gonna be? Are you gonna be there for the uh, the March on Harrisburg one too as well for some pictures? Yeah, I should be at March on Harrisburg. Um, yeah, uh, I just love. I mean, I'm I just know- saying, I love the stuff when you did uh, for the, the pictures that you got from them last time. Were just were just awesome. Yeah, because they so. always have a very good sense of theatrics, right? So, yes. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> Mike Pollock is probably one of the best. Yeah. organizers like he's one of the best people like i mean he is um so like it was during the little passover last week um was well while we met up at forest in maine so he's a rabbi and he's like nope i am uh participating in my three thousand year protest of the tyrannical egyptians <laughs> here we go <laughs> and showing like he's he's framing that up in like a in like a labor like continuing the struggle type of thing yeah not like in a religious sense which is actually pretty cool and that's the type of person like it's yep and yeah so uh he's like just sticking it to the egyptians and i'm drinking water there you go man there you go crazy all right man anything else good for, uh, for the good of the order no that's it 
Very cool. Oh, I want to give one more shout out. The one other thing I wanted to say is I had a chance to visit for the first. I've been meaning to go to this place for a long time. I had a chance to visit um, uh, Edge of the Woods Nursery. Right, it's a garden center nursery. Um, it is uh, on Route 100, about five minutes north of uh, of I 78, um, and they have all kind of like um, kind of indigenous species species, right? So of uh, of plants and everything that's na- everything that's native um, to Pennsylvania and the region. Um, they grow all that, and that's oh, they're devoted 100 percent to that. Because I've been doing just a bunch of say gardening and landscaping. It's becoming my uh, I think go to way of kind of like feeling grounded, no pun intended. Um, but just uh, just doing some stuff. And so I, w- I was out there um, yesterday on my way home. Uh, I just, you know, it was my last class yesterday for the semester. And so I said, you know what? I said, after I'm just going to go home and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go there. I wanted to go there. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get some stuff. And, and I did. They were so freaking helpful um, and just, just, just really awesome people. Um, kind of like very, very knowledgeable what's going on. They have a, amazing selection. They give like, they give tours. If you want to go out, you're not familiar with a different kind of, um, uh, different kind of plants that they have. They'll give you a tour of the entire place. It's, it's just a great, it's a great spot. Um, so um, kudos to those folks at edge of the woods nursery um, in Orville, Pennsylvania. That is about five minutes North of I 78 on route 100. So I just want to give them a shout out because I think it's um, a really good thing to be supporting. So, all right. Well, this has been um, Raging Chickens Out to Coop podcast, and uh, we're glad once again that you are here, and especially if you've made it all the way to the end. Uh, we'll be back next week with, no doubt, more craziness. See ya! Some people argue that although Medicare for all is a great idea, We need to move slowly to get there. But I needed Medicare for all yesterday. Millions of people need it today. The time to pass this law is now. Winning this reform will not be easy. The moneyed interests will do everything in their power to stop us. And yet despite these obstacles and despite the personal challenges that I face, I sit before you today a hopeful man, a hopeful husband.